Alright, so this lecture is about jQuery events. Um, okay, so events are the, the main method of communication between a user and a website or web application. And most of our JavaScript or jQuery coding will be run in response to a variety of user and browser events. By user events, are, I mean basically keyboard and mouse interactions like click, uh, click or mouse down, key press. Uh, browser events are mainly DOM events like document.ready, window.onload and many other events uh, related to DOM elements. When coding AJAX applications we also have custom jQuery AJAX events that are dispatched during the process of an AJAX request. That is AJAX send, AJAX complete, AJAX error and some more. jQuery's API is very consistent especially when it comes to events attaching a handler to any kind of event is done using the same code structure. So jQuery here, jQuery listener.bind event name handler function uh, which we'll get to in a little minute. This syntax also applies to a fourth category, category that I haven't mentioned yet. So jQuery's event system can be used for event-driven programming in which you can create your own custom events and then uh, they can be bound and triggered as regular ones. jQuery also provides a shortcut method for most common browsers and AJAX events. A model, uh, sorry, a model call using a shortcut would look like this at the bottom here, so we've got jQuery listener dot event name um, and a handler function. And when using bind, for example, event name will be a string wrapped in either single or double quotes. Um, and when using the shortcut, you simply put the event's name as the jQuery methods name. Okay, so let's have a look at some example then. Uh, well, not examples, but let's take a look a bit, a, a bit further. So we've got the top part using bind, so we have jQuery, then uh, applied to a div. The jQuery obviously can be a dollar, uh, dot bind, we've got click, and the handler function begins function E. Uh, using the shortcut we've just got jQuery div, uh, click, and, and then our handler function. So as you can see, bind has been changed with click. Uh, I'll use the shortcuts when available, uh, just because they're shorter uh, and easier to read. Both work equally and there's no advantage to using the shortcut other than clarity and brevity. It's simply a matter of taste. Okay, so let's use a fiddle. Okay, so in, in many common situations one needs to bind the same handler function to more than one event. On the same element that is. You could always do something like what we have on here, although that wouldn't really work to be honest. I mean, I know we can. That's a, applying a key down to a div, but that really doesn't make any difference to us whatsoever. Um, so I might, I might change that in the fiddle. Um, anyway. Right, yeah, it's not such a problem if the function is short, but for longer blocks of code, repeating them over and over won't be the, uh, that trivial, and it's definitely not the best approach. So there's there's more than one single solution, uh, more than a single solution to the, this simple but recurrent problem, um, and I'll get to that in just a second. But let's, let's just create a fiddle here. So if we go to JS Fiddle, I've already sort of set something up here, and you can see what I've done. Uh, in fact, you know what, I'll put it back to its original state. So I created a div. Uh, at the top here, I'm just commenting these out. As you can see, this part is the. In case you missed this bit or didn't watch the the video, this is the HTML part. I've created a div over here. I put my CSS, so of width of a hundred, height of a hundred, background color red. Just giving me this here. I'm going to change this back to div. Um, in fact, I'm going to leave it open to this. And it doesn't really make much sense this this setup here. I mean, this is exactly what we have here. It doesn't really make much sense. So if I run that, um, and I just make sure that my JavaScript's fine, it's perfect. And if I click on the div, then I get my event. But as you can see here, I don't ever get my other event. So it's simply not the case. So, for example, I could probably change this to... I could probably change this to text box. And... Um, since I'm on the Mac, I'll just get a hash symbol from here. That seems silly. 
I'm doing all this stuff just to get a hash. You could easily use the use something else. I'm gonna get to this in a second. Um, yeah. So let's just see what happens when I do this. I actually haven't tested this at all. Um, but if I bind both things to that, if I click on this this time, yeah, then I get that event. But if I also type something, then I get the other event. Brilliant. So I probably should have done that in the first place. But that was me just putting in a text box uh, and an ID or an input of type text with a, an ID. And then just being able to put both uh, events onto this. I'm actually quite curious as to what I get passed out here. So I'm going to click on there and see what I get uh, sent out. So this is my event. And uh, if I run that, um, I should be able to, to get something back from that. Yeah, an object. That's interesting. So, yeah, fr from there I should be able to get something quite good from that. Um, unfortunately, I, I would prefer to have the console in order to do that. I wonder what would happen if I, if I put the console in here. Console.log. Oh. Uh, you know, I've never, I've never tried the console inside the JS Fiddle. Let's find out what happens. I don't think there's much going to happen in our case. Yeah, jQuery is not defined. Oh, by the way, when you start out a JS Fiddle, you want to make sure that this here, it's got jQuery 1.7.2 or some kind of jQuery before you start doing stuff. Anyway, let's just run that and see what happens. Uh, see if we actually get anything. Yeah, we do. How fantastic is that? So this is uh, the object that's getting sent back by this second part here. We can actually get an object for the first part too, uh, from this E inside the function. Uh, and what I can, what we can do from that is you can, if you put in here dot, uh, dot key code in fact, dot key code, um, which is this here. Um, what I can do is run, and if I type in, say, for example, an A, um, I should, technically speaking, get 65 back. <laughs> It's very interesting, right? I mean, uh, I don't think that's actually the the key code for it. I mean, I can check the ASCII table. So 65 is a lowercase, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an uppercase I had, an uppercase A or a lowercase A, I, I can't remember, it's a lowercase A, it should be 32, shouldn't it? What about that one? 65, you can see me doing backspaces and such, so it's not making any distinction any distinction between lowercase and uppercase now, but, but anyway, that's just me um, showing you how this can work and the, and the console itself is pretty cool so in fact if I were to change that to an alert if you're not really sure about the console of course and um, this might be a bit scary and you might ask me lots of questions about it but you know if I pass this out again to an alert you can see that 65 appears there e.code okay so let's, uh, let's go back again um, okay so where was I Right, okay. Well, uh, that's me using a JS fiddle and showing you how we can attach two events to something, but, you know, sometimes it's not the best solution to do it like that. Um, there's actually another way to, to do that. Um, and we can bring it more, uh, we can simplify the, the issue. So, what we can do is we can create um, a function handler. So, but it's a different kind of function handler, that's, that's the issue. So, if we go back to the, the fiddle again, um, and say for example I just wanted to keep a hold of that so let's just do this in case we need to to copy something from that um, and I'll, I'll stick with the text box you know what I'm gonna get rid of the div there's no point in the div except for it being in the the slides uh, so it's a good thing that you watch the videos um, let's just say we've got dollar um, text box so I don't have to go looking for hashes again <laughs> They're easy to make from the accessibility. It's very strange that I'm using this uh, in a Mac, but never mind. So, say we had click um, handler. I mean, it doesn't make that again. This does not make sense. But anyway, what we can do is we can set it up like so. But obviously, we're looking for key down. And then close this off, um, which is fine. Right, now we need to create a function called handler. So if we set up a function, oh, handler, handler with an E, say down. Um, so inside there, if we have alert, e, uh, alert event. So, I 
keep pressing save and that's just a bit silly really because it's run ok let's see how that works we get event fine and we get event fine that's from uh, clicking and key pressing so good let's see if we can shorten that down so back to the slides again ok so that's one way of shorting it down uh, define a function once and then referring to it multiple times is not a bad approach but there's an even simpler one provided by jQuery bind accepts a list of events separated by spaces that means you can solve the, the previous problem in an even easier way so let's check that out let's check that out indeed so then if we go back to um, JS for the lax I haven't tested this either so I'm going to keep these in case I need to steal some stuff from it um, ok so let's just say we want to deal with the text box again we'll keep the function handler exactly the same um, in fact no we won't we'll steal the function handler so we'll take dollar dot bind I think that'll be our, our option dollar dot bind right fine and we want to deal with clicks but we also want to deal with key down then we want to have why does this take handler yeah, let's take handler, let's just see what happens here I've got a feeling this will work fine, this is not in my notes uh, that I made the other night but oh handler, handler doesn't exist, of course it doesn't exist, that's me being silly Right. So if we run that, yep, and yep, brilliant. So great, that's two ways of simplifying. So let's move on with the slides again. So you can also apply this behaviour to unbind and one. So uh, you bind and then you unbind, uh, and the reason we do that, well, there are good reasons for it. Um, to unbind a certain function, you need to have a reference to it. So even if you're using the multi-event feature, yeah, you need to keep a reference to the handler. If you don't pass the function to unbind, then any other event handler bound to that event will be removed as well. So we need to have something linking to that directly. So let me just show you how that works. So we've got an unbind. It's exactly the same thing. So we have an unbind directly to to this. So if we go back to the fiddle, um, let's unbind this. Hmm. So now, if I click on this, you can see nothing happens. Absolutely nothing happens uh, because handler doesn't exist, does it? Uncut reference error. That's weird. What have I done? It's silly. So it does kind of make sense uh, in an odd way. Um, basically speaking, if I, if I took this off oops, uh, and I run it, then everything should be fine, which does make perfect sense. And in fact, I can demonstrate the whole point of unbind if I took um, click, uh, if I run this, and if I click on it, then it will still persist. But if I type something, it won't persist at all because I'm unbinding these events from handler. I was getting confused with the errors to do with the JS fiddle rather than my um, rather than my little code trinket. Anyway, that's that's pretty much the idea. I know what you're thinking. What would be the point in that? But there is actually a point, uh, and I'll get to that very shortly. Uh, actually, you know what we need to do is go back to Chrome. Yeah. Right. <coughs> OK.
Okay, so reusing a handler function uh, with different data. Now I did kind of make this, um, uh, and I put it on put it on here. But the, there is some things that I need to add to it. They were they were very different than before. So you've probably come across a situation when you have many bindings and the handler functions look pretty similar. It doesn't matter whether these bindings are applied to different element and event uh, combination. The thing is, you don't want to repeat yourself over and over again. So as you can see from here, it's pretty much the same thing over and over again. It's just about trying to optimize your, your code. So again, let's, let's get a fiddle on the go. Um, I mean, I have I have some stuff set up in my notes already, as you can see down there. So uh, I wrote this out, so this should actually work fine. I hate this bloody notes thing. Um, okay, let's just take this, stick it inside here. Now we just have to hope that this works. Um, no. I think I had three buttons. I don't think I did anything with them except buttons, and they weren't coloured or such at the time. Um, so if I set up a div, I set up two divs. Oops, try to submit button. I may need an output. Div ID equals. Right, okay, so inside here we need uh, an input type. Input type equals button. I'm sure this is something you've done over and over again. Uh, if you're getting bored with me doing this, you can simply fast forward if you like. I'm going to call this button1, and I'm also going to give it the ID button1. Um, this is different from the example that was actually set in the text I took. So I kind of half had to make this up myself uh, as I went along, so hopefully everything works out fine. Okay, oops. Right, so that's our panel um, that we have set up. And it should be in correspondence to this, which it does seem like it is. So if we run that uh, with jQuery 1.0, uh, 7.2, if I click on this first one, the rest of them disappear and you get a nice little output so um, yeah, if I refresh the page extend the page, I do the same with that, refresh the page oh, no, I don't want to leave the page hmm, that's not good oh dear Right, I'll try and fix the code again. Silly me. I'm just going to set up what my notes say directly. That is quite annoying. I found one reason to hate JS Fiddle now. Never mind. Right, anyway, you get the idea now, right? Yeah, you get the idea. So, our code is fine, we've got a button set up, and if I click on, well I should, if I run this probably, that'll work. No, I've done something silly then. Oh, jQuery 1.7.2, so let's reset that as well. So there we go. Uh, this one and this one. Uh, the hides should work, and God knows why they've not worked. So there uh, must be something different in the slides. Yeah, so button one, I think, is what the difference is, or just the input itself. Okay, I had it set up a bit differently before. I did this, so that's input, input, input. If I run that, yeah. So now we're back to, to the scratch again. Uh, back to scratch again. Good. So now you get the idea. After all that palaver. Now, as you can see, uh, the only difference differences noticed on, on each handler are the buttons uh, to show the amount of code 
would grow as you add more buttons or each time the handler function get larger. So bind accepts an optional data argument uh, to be bound together with each specific handler um, so each specific handler function. And the data values will be accessible from within this function by accessing uh, event.data where event is the event object argument provided by jQuery. Well, now we should note that this uh, this value can be anything. Uh, it could be an array, a string, a number, or an object literal. And it's a common approach to pass an object literal, even if you are just making, uh, or sorry, just passing one value uh, to make the code more readable. This way, the name you give the single attribute within the object will make your code a little bit more self-explanatory. Event.data is used to provide pre-computed values to a function, which means the values you will be passing to bind need to be already available at binding time. To handle more dynamic values is another way that we will learn about later. The solution to the previous problem could look slightly different, in fact, if we, if we decided to use this method, of course. So the way in which we would go about doing this was to create um, a function, firstly. So it's not really going to make much difference in this case, I'm not going to lie to you, it's not really going to make much difference at all. Uh, so I'm just going to keep a hold of that uh, just now, although I can get it in a little second. But if we set up a function, for example, called button, uh, say clicked. Alright, within here, we're going to set up uh, the basis of of what we want to happen. So to start with we have uh, a dollar input dot hide. So that's what that's what we're basically saying up here is dot hide is repeated over and over again. And that's what we want to happen. Uh, next should be quite straightforward. Oops. But I'm just going to take the button from show. From show. Okay, so with the button from show, but in this case, what I'm going to be passing through, as you saw a minute ago, rather than this button here, I'm going to add an e dot data dot button. And we're going to get to that in a second. Uh, dot show, but don't worry about that. Next, it's going to be the output output text, which is going to be relatively straightforward. So jQuery dot output dot text. You click the button uh, e dot data. What we're we going to call it? So e dot data dot button. So it's just the same thing. And lastly, uh, just for just for argument's sake, I just want to pass something else in. I want to pass something called color. I mentioned color earlier. And the reason why I mentioned color earlier is actually from the book. Uh, this example is kind of taken from the book, but it's, it made a bit more sense to, to redo it uh, slightly. Oh, not just slightly, actually. It's just to redo it to make, to make it make more sense to what we're doing. So I'm going to add some CSS in. Uh, just because I like that about it. So CSS, so background color, and then we'll add something else in called e dot data uh, dot color. And the reason for me doing that, of course, was just to show you, um, uh, just to show you something a bit different. Okay. So that therefore we've got still our three buttons that we have to write something for. So we've got jQuery, but this time obviously we're we're binding. So dollar hash button one. Uh, dot bind, and it's just a click function that we're we're looking at now. But we're passing in uh, our data, event.data. So we have a button uh, called one. And we, I'm going to give the color red, why not? Uh, color is red. 
And you'll notice that I've got a U on my colour, but that's okay. <laughs> I like to do that. Oops, have I uh, put in the wrong bracket there? I certainly have. So this is like an object almost, it's some, uh, something getting passed in, it's like an object. And then button clicked, so we, we need to use the function button clicked. Okay. So we close it off. Now the good news is we can just copy and paste that three times and we've just got some minor changes to make. So we've got our minor changes are obviously this needs to be changed to two, three, uh, two, three, and whatever you want needs to be. I usually go blue or, or, or green. Let's go blue. Ooh, that doesn't make sense. Blue. Blue or green. Right, fine. And that, that should be exactly the same now. So that should be the same sort of thing. So you can see that we've kind of shortened the code down. Not well, we have shortened the code down, but not majorly. So now, if I do it, um, we, we should actually get something. Uh, we should actually get something happening. Uh, oh, sorry me. We've been going on about that U there as well. So if we do it again, yeah, there we go. Brilliant. If we do it again, great. So you can see the two in there, obviously, and the three. So yeah, so that's what we need to do. So we could pass other things in there. Of course, you can make this uh, even shorter by using a loop. Uh, this approach is called a macro by some coders, and it's a very common approach for jQuery code. We're going to be using that when we're using uh, kinetic.js. These macros will surely uh, reduce the code length and can sometimes improve code readability. Some other times they'll just make your code completely unreadable, so sometimes it's not a good idea to use them. Uh, you know, and I, and I'm not going to penalise you either way on that. Just to make that clear, I just need to check out what's going on here. Right, we've still got a bit of time. So, uh, yeah, let's try let's try doing something else then. So we've got a good example here. Uh, I'm going to keep a hold of that in case we need to butcher it up. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to carry out a loop um, using each. You all used Java before, so you've you've probably seen that sort of thing. So if we if we take jQuery dot each from some some array, for example, uh, for colors. So if we set up a, a red, blue, and green, because it, you know when we're setting up array, any any array of objects is going to give us uh, a numbered list uh, indexed at zero, but of length, for an example, in this case three. So it's going to be zero, one, and two. And if you just add a 1 to each one of those elements, it would be 1, 2, and 3, which is actually what we need. So this is my sort of thinking behind it. Um, so we want to set up a function where we have a num and a color being added. So uh, our num is plus plus, and that's simply because... Um, and like I said before, this is element 0, but we need button 1. So that means and uh, dollar now I'm gonna take button uh plus num that'll be what I do button plus num okay so in in uh, in any case it's gonna be button either one two or three now and we want to bind a click to that so I'll bind click and then a function, and we'll just write a callback function in here. Um, and we have our, our three things. So we've got jQuery input dot hide button num. Yeah, yeah, it's all pretty much the same. So if we take, let's let's take this for just now. And stick it in there. Now there's no reason to to change the jQuery to a dollar, although I quite like it better. Um, but never mind. And then lastly, we have our output for our colors. There's no point in having them in there if we're not going to use them. Output uh, dot CSS. Well, I could just take it from here, it's exactly the same thing, um, except all I need is that. Uh, and it is 
colour that's been passed in. I think that does a job, so that's a loop. Now uh, we've set up an array we're going to loop through for each one of these three functions. Um, we're passing in the number num, and yeah, so let's, let's just do that. So we're building our page, uh, so we click the button one, that's fine. So we're passing in a number, and that's good. Fine. Okay. So as you can see, uh, I haven't used the date argument uh, because we don't really need it. Uh, the code is now somewhat shorter, but not that much, and it's certainly not more readable. I would I would imagine this this should be the pinnacle of what you would want to to achieve is this sort of thing down here. Um, the conclusion is that both approaches can be used on this kind of situation depending on the problem. Uh, one could be better or shorter, more readable, easier to maintain than the other. So let me just check how much time we've got. Uh, we're running out of time a bit, but let's just keep... Let's press on a little bit. Okay, so removing a whole set of handlers. Um, so you made a plugin uh, like Blocker Code uh, that binds many event handlers to certain DOM elements. Later, uh, you want to clean them all up in order to dispose of the plugin completely. This could get a little lengthy if you add many handlers. Maybe you don't even have access to the bound handlers because they belong to another local scope. Now, you can't unbind every handler uh, for a certain event or any existing event because you could be deleting other handlers that you didn't take into account. So, use a unique namespace for each plugin you make and any handler bound within this plugin must be added with this namespace. And later, when cleaning up, you just need to unbind the whole namespace and all the related event handlers will go away with one single line of code. Okay, so how to bind with a namespace? Well, that's uh, something different altogether. To add, um, to add a namespace to an event type, you simply add uh, a dot followed by the namespace type uh, name. So we have our jQuery function, this is a plugin, um, is equal to function, and then you've got a click. So normally we have click here, bind click, we have click.myplugin, uh, and mouse down dot my plugin. So that's really it, that's how we set up a namespace. You can uh, add more than one namespace per event. This is how, yeah, so I mean, that, that's pretty much it really. I, I don't, there's nothing much else to add there. We're not gonna spend an awful lot of time on plugins anyway. It's not really a sort of thing. So how to clean up your plugin. Um, to dispose uh, the bindings uh, in the last slide, you would do jquery.fn.dispose my plugin equals function return this dot unbind dot whatever your plugin is. So it would get rid of the click, it would get rid of the mouse down, it would get rid of everything which is associated with dot my plugin. Ah, okay. Triggering specific event handlers. Namespaces can be used for triggering as well. When binding, you need to make sure you add a unique namespace to each set of the handlers. This can also be used for the opposite situation. If you need to trigger any event except those with a namespace, you can use the operator um, exclamation mark, which is used for not. Um, so you, you need to trigger it an event uh, on certain circumstances or, or many. Uh, this element belongs to one or more plugins so it may have event handlers bound to this event. Uh, the problem is that 
This event is a common one, like click or mouse down. Or, or simply triggering the event could run other event handlers uh, that you didn't expect. So how to trigger uh, handlers with a certain namespace. Now say you want to programmatically trigger the click event bound by the plugin, uh, my plugin. You could simply trigger the click event but that would be a bad approach because any other handler bound to the same event would get fired as well. This is how to do it properly. Okay. So jquery.fn run my plugin equals function return this dot trigger click dot my plugin. Okay, we're not going to spend an awful lot of time on, on these sort of things, but anyway, uh, we'll press on. So how to trigger handlers that do not have a namespace? So on the contrary, you might need to trigger a click or any other event, but the target element belongs to one or more plugins. Triggering uh, an event could run undesired uh, event handlers and that would cause problems uh, that will be pretty hard to debug. So assuming all plugins did use a namespace, this is how to trigger um, click safely. So we have at the bottom jquery dev.panels dot trigger then click. So let me check the time. Okay, so you want to pass certain values to an event handler, but they're not known at binding time and they would change uh, with each call to the handler. There are two ways of solving this problem. Passing extra arguments to trigger, passing a custom event object to trigger. Both approaches work and neither is clearly better than the other. Passing data to the handler instead of making the function grab it from somewhere, uh, like global variables, jQuery, namespace, etc. makes the code easier to maintain because you keep a handler function simple and agnostic from the environment. This also allows you to reuse the same handler for many situations. Hmm. Trigger can receive one or more values that will be passed on to the trigger handlers. These values can be of any type and any amount and when you have more than one you need to wrap them with an array. So here we have jQuery form dot trigger submit, which is our event. Then we've got John Doe twenty eight gender inside this these curly brackets for an object, and also the, this array. It should be similar to when you were looking at JSON, if you know what I mean. You you can yeah you can understand that slightly, I'm sure. Uh, anyway, the the bound function. Well, okay. Yeah, the bound function for the preceding case would be something like this, so down here. So we have jQuery form, so we've got a form somewhere, dot bind, then we have a submit, which is our event, then we have um, a function, which is going to be e, or event, sorry, uh, name, surname, age, and extra, and we could do something with these arguments. Uh, actually, hold on a minute. Um, I don't know if I explained that well enough. Uh, well, I know that the idea of this is simple to simple enough or easy to read. Um, the only problem is, I suppose, doing this, and you're wondering where these are coming from. And it's pretty obvious that name is here, surname, age, and whatever happens to be extra as an object which you would deal with inside here. Um, but you know, it does go a little bit wrong when you. Well, it doesn't go wrong, but it's sometimes a little bit more tricky when you put more than say four or five elements in, uh, four or five sorry, um, of these arguments. It's also kind of misleading if you are only used to having your, your event, your E, function E. Um, you really start to wonder where um, the other arg arguments come from. 
you know, and how they can possibly be there. So it's kind of annoying in that way. Anyway, so use within a programmatic event. Now let's just explain this uh, here just now. So what I have um, is some tag or some element called uh, with an ID slideshow. And I'm going to bind something called add function, uh, in which a callback function is defined by an event and uh, a source which has been passed in. So down here you can see that the event is add image and the source is um, image. Um, dogs4.jpg, but we don't have that, but we're going to do something with it. Here we've got a variable called dollar $image, which is a little bit confusing considering we're using jQuery. Perhaps just image would be a little bit better. And we also have jQuery in here, we then want to make a tag, an image tag called, uh, well an image tag with a source attribute, um, the same as the source that's being passed in. Um, then, to make this a, be appended, to the to the the div that we're going to make called slideshow, we have we call we have jQuery this this applying to to this the the slideshow div uh, and append um, dollar image. So let's just have a little quick look at that then. Um, let's look at a fiddle. Yeah. So I've got one set up here already with exactly what we have there except dogs has been taken out. So all we need to do is add something here that has an ID. It was a nice choice for a container I would say. And a nice choice for a container in this case is indeed um yeah. Uh is indeed a div. Right, okay. So we need an image. So let's go and find a jQuery image. Let's type in jQuery. Let's go for it. jQuery images. Let's take that one. Uh, view original image. I'm just going to take a link to that. It's probably not a good idea to do this <laughs> uh, due to the infringements and copyright and all this stuff, but I don't see any reason not to do it here. Uh, and if I run this, technically speaking, yeah, it should appear inside here. Brilliant. So, you know, I might as well add here that when you're doing something with a JS fiddle and you want to put it into a normal piece of you know HTML. All you need to do is just set up your normal header tags. Um, put whatever CSS and you're in in there and say style or, or add a file in the way that you would know how to do that. Um, do it whichever is easier for you or whatever I ask for I suppose in the assignment. Um, and uh, then after that stick some JavaScript and we'll stick jQuery in first of all either using the CDN um, or apply script tags and just apply uh, this code at the bottom or again pull in a separate um, file, a JavaScript file um, and that should be good enough. Uh, this inside the body I would say put jQuery and your your JavaScript file or this this, this JavaScript here or jQuery uh, below that. So you, you should have whatever jQuery library you're, you're bringing in should be above this um, jQuery code. JavaScript code. Anyway, that was just a quick point. Okay. So where am I? Let's go back to the thing. Yep. So let's go. Okay, so used within uh, a real event. Um. Okay, now I think I, I made something like this for you. I'm just trying to remember. Um. Okay. So yeah, this is this. Try and build something again um, in a fiddle. So let's try and build something in a fiddle. Now, I actually have something already set up for this, so I'm just going to take that. Um, so if I escape here, yeah, I've got it down here. The only problem with taking this directly means that it adds, adds unwanted things. I'm going to keep this just now. Always goes wrong when you do these things live for the first time. Um, in fact, it's about the third time I've done this. Um, when I started recording the video, I mean. Now you get unwanted characters in here that you can't see. Which is probably quite common to people who do web development. You should probably know something about that. Um, okay, so let's add. So we've got an input type, 
button. So if I run it this time, it should work, hopefully. Yeah, okay. So the trigger calls click and passes true. Uh, and since submit is true, we have if submit, which is Boolean value true or false, and true gives us woohoo. Now if I click the button itself, because I've not added uh, anything to true, it will not pass true and it will pass false. So there we have dope. Okay. Good. Right. So back to the slides. Okay, so passing a custom event object. If you choose to pass a custom event object instead, uh, each value you pass has to be accessed as an attribute on the event object received by the handler. This means that no matter how many data you're passing, the handler will always have only a single argument, the event object. This is already an advantage over the, the first approach because it makes the, de the function declaration less verbose. So here's there's an example there. Um, he could you know the, the first example uh, with a, a custom object. So this is what we have here. So we bind a submit, and we have a function which tells us to do something with these events getting passed in. Well, not, not events, but uh, this object being passed in, and we can get that from our event. Dot name. So you know what is interesting is I didn't make one up for this, but I would like to just now, and I think, yeah, yeah, let's, let's just give that a go. This is where it can go horribly wrong, but I do like to do this if you've been in my classes before. Um, if you're taking this for a longer period of time, of course, you might have been in my classes. I do like to take these chances from time to time. Right, okay. Uh, so this could take a little bit. I do apologize for it. But, um, you know, let's just go with something. So, you know what? I'm going to console.log E. Now, hopefully, oops, hopefully when I run this, so, oops, sorry, I need to make a form. I'm just going to keep everything. I'm kind of like that in the house, you know, a hoarder. <laughs> right, okay. Form. Uh, I'm going to stick a thing in here of type submit. Let's just see what happens when I do that. Error, please use post request. <laughs> Oops. Uh, that's interesting, isn't it? That's more like it. Okay, so it doesn't matter about this because we're not really doing anything. Um, what I'm doing is passing out to the the console. I mean, that's really what I'm doing. So, uh, you know, the worst thing about using JS Fiddle is it it gives you all this other stuff because it's not really meant for po you know proper. What well, it's meant for fiddling, I suppose, rather than doing a proper. Um, a uh, piece of coding. But as you can see, the event has been passed through. We have type, submit, name, John, surname, Doe, age 28, and gender, M. Uh, now, if I decided then that I wanted those, I could console.log, uh, in this case, name, because it's name down here. And if I run that, it'll pass out John. So even better than that, if you're still a bit confused about what I'm doing here, if I alert, and I run it, 
Oops. Well, alert dialog, so silly me. If I alert, and John should appear. So fantastic, that's exactly what I wanted to do. Sorry, the, the, this is all a little bit in, sort of insane, and this output does kind of make sense, but um, we're not actually trying to pass it to anywhere. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. So let's go back again. So, it's pretty cool. You're kind of understanding what, what I'm getting at. It's pretty cool indeed. So, yeah. Okay, so accessing an element ASAP, so before document.ready, this is not really something you're going to have to deal with very much. Or you, you might have to, of course, so, yeah, but there are ways to get around it. You need to gain access to a certain DOM element uh, as soon as possible. Uh, using document.ready isn't fast enough. You really want to control this element before the page finishes rendering. Issues like this are especially noticeable on large pages where the document.ready uh, event takes longer to be reached. This is a very common and generic problem that can be solved in many way different ways. Uh, there's one approach that works for all of them, but it requires pulling the DOM, so it adds overhead to the, the page rendering process, so it's not desirable. But there are some, these are, are some of the usual problems where one could rely on pulling, so hide an element right away before it is rendered, or another style of operation. Bind event handlers to an element ASAP so that it quickly becomes functional in any other situation. Okay. So hide an element right away or another style operation. So your your problem is directly related to styling. Um, you want to add a conditional styling to an element, and this condition needs to be evaluated by JavaScript. Now, the right way to go about it is adding a specific CSS class to an element that is qu uh, quickly accessible, like the HTML element, and then style the element accordingly. So you want to do something like this, right? I mean, you want to you want to take this, create HTML dot no message uh, with the ID message and display none. And somewhere on the page, um, the, the, well, certainly the bad way of doing it would be to, to call uh, jQuery document already because you wait till the document's ready before removing it from the page. Uh, however, uh, the correct method is jQuery HTML dot add class no message. So it adds this class um, from HTML. And what you do now, this is the, the pure G, uh, JavaScript way of doing it, uh, and what it does is it doesn't display this message here. So that's that's what we would use that for. That's pretty straightforward. Just put that into a page and run it. Okay. Okay, so bind event handlers to an element ASAP. Um, so very often we have this large page with interactive elements like buttons and links. You don't want those elements to just hang in there without any uh, so sorry, to just hang in there without any functionality attached while the page loads. Luckily, there's a great concept called event delegation that can save the day. You can now bind event handlers to elements that still don't exist by using uh, the method live. That way, you don't need to worry about waiting for the element to be ready in order um, to bind the events. So, here, um, this is really what we call any other situation. Your problem isn't about styling or, or about events. Um, you fall into you know the sort of bad group, I suppose, and where we can all start sort of panicking. So we don't want to pull anything, as we've done just recently, you know, um, because we're certainly concerned about performance. So polling, polling can be implemented with a a simple interval, set interval that checks for an element, and once found, a certain function is run and the interval needs to be cleared. So there are two plugins that can aid you with this. One is LiveQuery, which has an option to register a function to be run for each newly found element that matches a selector. This approach is pretty slow, but supports the whole set of selectors. There's another plugin called Element Ready. Uh, that will also handle the situation properly. It lets you register pair, uh, register pairs of ID and function, and it will pull the DOM once an ID is found, and the function will be called, and the ID is removed from the queue. This plugin implements probably the fastest approach to detect elements that is using document .get element by ID, and this plugin is pretty fast, but only supports IDs. Okay. 
customly position scripts. So the, the whole document ready concept means after the HTML is parsed, um, this means the browser reached the body's closing tag, body. In other words, instead of using document already, you could simply put your scripts right before body. Uh, the, the end tag, sorry, the end tag for body. You can apply the same principle to other parts of the DOM and you can add a script right after the element you want to access and you can know for certain that it will be already accessible from it. Okay, so as you can see there's no po polling uh, was needed in this case. This is a feasible solution if you don't need to use it or uh, use it a lot or you'll be adding tons of scripts to the page. So here what we have is this set up here with time and then we run our JavaScript afterwards. Okay, or a jQuery afterwards. So I'm just going to check the time because this is this will be the another time where I've lost a whole recording. Okay, stopping the the handler execution loop. So you have several handlers bound to the same element or event combination and you want to, from within a handler, prevent the rest from being called, so something like what event.stoppropagation does. The problem is that event.stoppropagation only works for elements that are below the current element in the DOM hierarchy. Event objects passed to... Uh, sorry, I've got something stuck here. So event objects passed to handlers have a new method called stop immediate propagation. This method will do just that and no subsequent event handler will be notified of the current element. It will also stop the event's uh, propagation just like stop propagation does. If you want to consult the event object to know whether it uh, whether this method has been called, you can do so by calling event .is immediate propagation stopped, which will return either true or false. Stop immediate propagation can cancel the actual submit binding or bindings if a certain situation is met. So here's some code in the slide um, that you can look at. Okay, so we have uh, some form, then we have a submit attached to it with uh, an event, then we prevent the default so we don't allow it to submit for real. Um, now if the jQuery hash field dot val is equal to blank, then we don't want to submit at all. Uh, then we have submit function e only executed if the function above didn't call e dot stop immediate propagation. Okay, so basically if there was something in there, it would allow it to, it would allow it to submit through. All right. Okay, so it can also be useful for disabling events or blocking containers temporarily. Um, so this is some, uh, our set of code that we're going to be looking at uh, for just now. While this new feature could be a lifesaver in some situations, you must be aware that basing your logic on this behaviour isn't all that safe. When you rely on this feature, you assume that the handlers will be executed in order to in order in the order you expect in that no other handlers will get in the way. While events bound with jQuery are executed in the same order, uh, they're added. It's not something the API strongly supports, meaning it could fail in some browsers or some special situations. Uh, it's also possible that bindings from different plugins could collide because one could call stop immediate propagation and the other wouldn't get executed. This could cause unexpected problems and could uh, that could take a long time to debug. The conclusion is don't be afraid to use stop immediate propagation if it really suits your problem, but do use it with caution and double check all the event handlers involved. So you should 
rather think twice before using it in these situations. So the listener is a popular DOM element <laughs> that is also used by other plugins. Uh, the event is a common one like click or ready. Uh, these are a great chance of collisions. And on the other hand, it should be pretty safe to use. Um, and you know these situations that the listener is a DOM element that is dynamically created and used merely by one plugin. The event is a custom event like change color or add user. Um, or you intentionally want to to stop any bound handler like um, yeah in the second example. So here, um, the function check whether it's enabled. Uh, if jQuery this is disabled, e dot stop immediate propagation, so stop all handlers, and e prevent default. And then we have jQuery, and we have some plugin called Buttonize. Um, so you can return uh, CSS the cursor and pointer to to bind click and mouse down and mouse up, and we check whether it's enabled, right? So. That's that. Okay, here's something that may be a bit more useful to you. Okay. We have all fallen for this at least once, alright? So, in the last tutorial I think I gave you some little boxes and I showed you there was little bugs when you click on them several times opens and closes and all that stuff and trying to solve this problem is sometimes a bit of an issue uh, and it all comes from uh, this sort of problem okay so what we can do is we can obviously make some sort of cool animation that does those sort of things and um, I've actually got code already set up because I recorded this um, I think two nights ago and um, it broke right at the end when it was rendering in fact, it could have been last. No, it was two nights ago. Anyway, okay. So, um, in this case, for example, we could be enlarging an element each time the mouse rolls over it, uh, and then shrinks to its original size once the mouse rolls out. All goes well until you quickly move the mouse over and out of that element, and you wonder what's going on because it just carries on many times. So jQuery's like hash something element suddenly gets resized back and forth many times blah 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 and the solution is indeed simple uh, too simple but the problem is so recurrent that um, this is probably one of the most useful things you're going to do uh, and in fact one of the dissertation students had an issue with um, something similar to do with mouse clicks what you need to do in order to avoid this nasty effect simply kill all existing animations on the element before you create a new one. Uh, to do so you have to use jQuery stop method and it will, uh, as the name, say, the name says or implies, stop the current animation and optionally remove the following um, ones as well. So let's have a little look at that before we go move any further. Let's go to Fiddle if it's still open. Yes it is. Right, okay. Now I'm going to get rid of this just now and we're going to sit and think about what we're... you know what? I'm going to keep it there because there's no point in getting rid of it, is there? So we just copy and paste it. So what this basically does... Uh, sorry. What this basically does is it simply just... Um, makes this bigger and smaller. Makes this box at the right hand side, this div, which I've got some CSS for here. I made it some arbitrary sizes. Um, Okay, so again I'm going to do exactly the same here, copy and paste, and we're going to run it. Okay, so if I, if I open this up, yeah, great, right? Brilliant. If I scroll in, scroll it, now watch this. Now, that is annoying, right? And where we want to use stop is, is here. So if I were to add stop into this, for example. Oops. Then it should kill the function. So if we if we run this, you can see it's kind of it has some opacity there, right? Um, but obviously that it doesn't deal with it too well here. Um, but anyway, I'm going to scroll over this 
Now, if I do this lots of times, you can see that it stops the function from doing it, right? So, however, the problem with this is that this stop function only kills fade to, and fade to makes it go from this opaque color or the opacity at point eight to one, right? Now it only stops any changes back and forward, and we can't actually see that. So in fact, in some ways, I should uh, probably get rid of this. Mm, yeah, let's get rid of that. I'm kind of annoyed by that. Um, let's make the width bigger. Let's take a gamble on this and make the width bigger. So let's go to 100. What is the width? 50. Right. Now, this should make it kind of clearer if it works well enough anyway. Animate. Right. I think this will work. Hopefully anyway. Uh, run. Okay, now, so the opacity is set there. I'm actually going to get rid of that because it's really annoying. Um, and we've still got a stop in here. So let me just take the stop out again. And we'll start from start from the beginning. Uh, if this works well enough, we'll start from the beginning. Otherwise, I'll pause and it'll be seamless. Anyway, okay, when I scroll over this, it, yeah, so that's pretty good, right? I mean, that's that's pretty good. It's exactly what I want to do. It makes it bigger, first of all, then it changes the height, then it does the the width again, it does the height. Now, if I had to put a stop in here, uh, in fact, let's not do that yet. Let's not do that yet. So let's, let's do the this thing. Now, I'll just continue to do that forever for a long time anyway um, and that's not what we want so by using stop we should be able to stop this but I'm actually deliberately doing this wrong here to, to move on to the next bit um, to show you how sometimes jQuery works so in this case if I do this watch oops have I missed out something yes I missed out a dot As you can see, it stops the width from happening. Or it did stop the width from happening when I was doing that, but it didn't stop the height. So these things were still getting run. And in order to stop that, if I can go back to the slides for a second and let it carry out what, it, what it's doing. Um, Went to the wrong place, sorry. Yeah, so to, to manage it to, to get it to stop from doing this. So only the height, but not, not really the width in this problem because using stop is okay. However, stop only removes the current animation. Um and we want to stop all animations. In order to be able to stop all all animations, what we have to add uh, is we have to pass um, a true. So we have to pass a true in there. So let's just do that and let's go back to our fiddle and let's just pass a true inside stop. Okay, so now if we run it and we do one, so let's just hover over, great, right? And everything works fine. Now, if I do lots of times, it doesn't do anything. In fact, if I do a little bit and I hover in and out, it kills the animation for all of them and that's exactly what we need to do alright so that's that's what's what we have to do uh, is put a true in there and that solves that very common problem so let's get back to the slides again and get moving on okay so making uh, event handlers work for newly added elements so you bound one or more event handlers and they suddenly stop working it happens after new elements are added dynamically dynamically by an ajax request or something um, or, or a simple jQuery operations append or wrap. This problem is incredibly common, and we've all fallen it for at least uh, we've all fallen for it a few times. I'm pretty certain you'll fall for it again. Now, um, so th there are two possible solutions for this recurring problem, each with its own pros and cons. So rebinding. This approach requires you to call bind again and again every time new elements are added. It's pretty easy to implement and doesn't require any plugin or new method. You can simply have all the bindings in a function and call it after uh, call it again after each update. Each delegation um, 
sorry, event event delegation, and it relies on event bubbling. This is fast and light, but requires a little understanding and can be just a little tricky at times. And bubbling is a big issue. There's also built-in support for event delegation, um, and we just want to use the live method instead of bind. In fact, you should be using on and off anyway, but we're just going to stick with bind for just now. Anyway, why do event handlers get lost? JavaScript as opposed to CSS is a declarative language. Uh, you don't have, uh, you don't describe behaviors, and they get uh, automatically applied. JavaScript, like most other programming languages, is imperative. The developer specifies a sequence of actions to perform, and they get applied as the line of code is reached. When you add a piece of code like this, uh, you know, function handler alert got clicked. Um, jQuery, you know, dot clickable dot bind click handler. Um, this is basically what you're doing. So you look for all elements in, with a CSS class clickable, and save it to the collection. Then you bind the handler function to click um, event of each element in the collection. If JavaScript uh, jQuery were interpreted interpreted declaratively, the previous code would mean the following: each time. Um, an element with the CSS class clickable is clicked, run the function handler. However, because JavaScript jQuery is interpreted imperatively, uh, imperatively, the only elements that will get bound are those that match the selector at the time it is run. So if you add new elements with a clickable class or you remove the class from an element, the behaviors won't be added or removed for those elements. And that is very annoying. Uh, and it's a very true um, problem. Okay. So, Event delegation. Event delegation consists of binding once uh, at the start and passively listening for events to be triggered. It relies on the fact that many events in the browser bubble up. As an example, after you click a div, its parent node receives a click event as well, and then it passes to the parent's parent and so on until it reaches the document uh, element. And that's a huge problem, and that's the problem that the, this, the dissertation student from last year had, where they weren't really sure what they were doing, and they were getting, you know, they were clicking once and everything was fine, they were clicking twice, and then all of a sudden it was carrying out three times. Uh, it, so they were clicking it twice, but then it would carry out the, the two again rather than once, if you know what I mean. So click once, it happens. Click once again. Again, it happens, it happens. Click another time, it happens, it happens, it happens. And it was very annoying because, um, you know, he was trying to add things and remove things. And if you think about it, if you're adding and removing, what it does is it adds and removes and adds and removes. And what you have to do is put conditions in. You also had to try and unbind these events quite a lot. Uh, so he really had to think about the problem. Okay. Uh, so pros and cons of each um, approach. Rebinding is... Um, is simple. You just re-add the event handlers, at least to a new problem, such as adding event handlers to elements that were already bound. Some add CSS classes to work around this problem, marking those bound with a certain class. All this requires uh, CPU cycles, and every time the events are updated, and requires more and more event handlers to be created. Um, one way to work around both problems mentioned is to use named functions as event handlers. If you always use the same functions, then you've solved the duplication problem, and the overhead is smaller. Still, uh, rebinding can lead to higher and higher amounts of RAM taken as time passes by. Event delegation just requires an initial binding and there's no need to deal with rebinding at all. This is quite a relief for the, the developer and makes the code shorter and clearer. The RAM problem mentioned before doesn't apply to event delegation and that the content of the page might change, but the active event handlers are always the same. Event delegation has a catch though, and in order for it to work the code that handles it, live uh, a plugin of your own code. Uh, must take the element that got the event, event.target, and go through its ancestor to see which ones have event handlers to trigger along with some more processing. This means that event, while event delegation requires less binding, it requires more processing each time an event is triggered. Also, event delegation cannot be used with events that don't bubble, such as focus and blur. For these events, there's a workaround that consists cross that works um, cross browser using the focus in and focus out events in some browsers. Event delegation uh, seems like a nicer approach, but it requires X processing. So I would just use okay. Well, if we use live bindings, uh, just when you really need them. 
Um, in, under two common situations, dynamic elements, so you have a list of DOM elements that changes dynamically, large lists, so event delegation can work faster when you bind one live binding instead of say 100 from the regular ones. This is faster at the start and takes less memory. If there's no need to use live, then just go for bind. If you then need to make it live, switching should be just a matter of seconds. Okay. Oops. Uh, okay, so we move on to the last part of um, uh, of this, which is more about sort of honing in on uh, you know the kind of events that we're going to be doing. Okay, so mobile devices such as smartphones and tablets usually have um, a capacitive touch sensitive screen to capture interactions made with the, the user's fingers. Um, and as the mobile web evolves to enable increasingly sophisticated applications, web developers need a way uh, to handle these. So, uh, any fast-paced game uh, requires a player to press multiple buttons at once, which in the context of a touch screen uh, implies multi-touch. Now, Apple introduced uh, multi-touch uh, touch events API in iOS 2.0. Android has been catching up to this de facto standard and also closing the gap pretty quickly. I think I think they're pretty much um, as close as it gets together. Um, we're going to have a look at the touch events API um, provided by iOS and Android. Explore what sorts of applications we can build and present some, you know, and we'll have some basic our best practices and cover cover some useful techniques to make it easier to develop touch enabled applications. So we have three basic uh, touch events and they're outlined in the spec and implemented widely across the mobile device uh, across mobile devices. So we've got touch start, so that's where a finger is placed on a DOM uh, element, touch move, a finger is dragged along a DOM element, and touch end, a finger is removed from a DOM element. Each touch event includes three lists of touches. So touches is a list of all fingers currently on the screen. Target touches is a list of fingers on the current DOM element. Uh, change touches um, a list of fingers involved in the current event. So for example in a, a touch end event this will be the finger that was removed. Okay. So, these lists consist of objects that contain touch information. So, identifier, a number that uniquely identifies the current finger in the, the touch session. Target is a DOM element that was the target of the action. Client page and screen coordinates where on the screen the action happened. Radius coordinates and rotation angle describe the ellipse that approximates the finger shape. So let's inspect an example. Um, right. Okay. Well, well, I I put some of these online. Um, no, I just have to try and figure out where they are. But let's just. Um, I think I put them inside here. Um, So I was playing with these just recently, so if I open my Dropbox folder and say public, there should be touch test. And I think that's the one that we have on the screen just now, although I was sort of playing with that and using jQuery instead and you know stuff like this. Yeah, I think that's exactly that, right? Okay, so this is uh, from an example directly from um, the HTML5 Rocks website and I think it's pretty cool. Now if I decided to, to run this, so let's just say I took this and um, I posted it on my store, put it on my screen, uh, put it on my desktop in fact, let's just, let's just do that. So if I take this and put it on my desktop, there's probably already one there, I just can't see it. Okay, now if I double click on this, the issue is, there's not really much I can do with this. Um, 
because I don't have touches. But you could use the the emulator that I was talking about earlier. But using the con uh, using sorry the the developer tool. So what you do is right click. Just in case you're not sure about that, forget about this. You right click on Chrome, inspect element, and you go down to this little button at the bottom called settings. Then you can click on um, emulating touch events and things like that and whatever user agent you want, I don't know, um, why not go for iPhone 5 <laughs> and it changes it to look like an iPhone 5. Now all this does is it allows me to click on this div element and move it around the page. Now I'm going to get rid of that because it's really annoying but um, maybe I should try and make the, the screen a bit bigger again and get rid of the device metrics. Okay, so let's just inspect what basically this does. I have a div called drag me. I set the position to be absolute so I can move it anywhere on the page. Um, and we have background color is blue, width is 100px, height is 100px. And then I set what my touch start, um, e.prevent default, uh, and document.body.add event listener touch move. Uh, function e event dot prevent default. Now the reason for that is that on my iOS phone, when I look at that on my my iOS phone, if, so if you want to look at it, for example, why not stick it in say Dropbox folder, go into public, um, right click on it, go to Dropbox and copy the public link and email yourself, and then what you can do is just click on that and you'll you'll get access to it on your phone. Um, I've not tried this with the emulator yet. Uh, I should probably try it with the emulator just now, but I'm not. Um, yeah, okay, maybe maybe I can. Uh, let's see if I can find what I'm looking for. Hmm. It does take its time. Right, that's what I hate. Oh, oh dear. Right. Um. So program files. Uh, not program files. Clips in here. I've opened up a clips run. You know, I've not really tried this very much. In fact, I'm just going to pause this just now to try and save some memory. Anyway, I've just decided to move on. Um, opened up the Android. Uh, it works okay. Uh, it's not great, but it's no better than this. So realistically, this is, um, as you can see, we always go to the top left hand corner, um, but by emulating touch events, we can easily do whatever you want on these. It's not great, but it, it's fine. Okay, well, let's inspect the code then. Um, what this does, what these do, when you go into your iOS browser, or if you've got an iPhone, or even an Android, I'm not sure how it works on Android, I do have an Android phone, I just don't use it very often, is that when you put your finger on, when you open Safari, and you move it up and down, the actual full browser screen moves. Uh, and if you move your finger, uh, you know, selects things, if you put two fingers on it and then open it, uh, open your fingers out, then it changes size, and it's pretty annoying. So what we do is we prevent all default actions or events uh, at this point. Um, uh, with those two points here. Now similarly, uh, at the top here, you'll see this meta tag you've probably not seen before. This um, meta tag is useful because it sets the width and the height of the full screen and it doesn't allow you to scale using that pinching way you know where you put your two fingers on and you just open them out and it gets it bigger and it's smaller but you know that, that's good anyway so here we use var obj equals document dot get element by id so document dot get uh, document get dot element by id is exactly the same as using the jquery selector in this case we've got drag me so you could do a bit of mixing and matching here, um, but I wouldn't bother. Anyway, object dot add event listener touch move function event. You can have an e in there; it doesn't really matter. Now, if event dot target touches equals one, then you want to pass out console dot log touched, and var touch equals event dot target touches zero console dot log touch. So I mean, I can put these things out to the to the console, so if we have a little look at the console, it should be going nuts, right? I mean, so, uh, and you know, so what the two things I've passed out is basically saying if if we've actually touched something, um, you know, if target touches, because event target touches is the 
is whether anybody's put any finger on there at all, then it means that the screen has been touched. But I've also passing out this um, this touch uh, object, which is the first. Because since I'm only expecting one finger on there, because zero uh, zero index, it's one finger. So event dot target touches. Uh, I'm passing touch to the console which gives me an object out and I'm able to get things from this object so if I open one of those up for example uh, I should probably stop moving it around uh, you can see many things about that so we can see where we are on the page um, the client X client Y so these are different you should check this out it's got screen X and screen Y you know about where, where you are and, and things like this um, you, you've also got other information on here that you can get access to and use to make the user experience slightly better. I just take client X. Okay, so let me show you how I access that. Basically, the object dot style dot left. Now, object dot style dot left is basically because object is grabbing this div, right? And I want to make it where it is left and top on the screen based on the style, and I change that to be touch.pagex with px at the end because that's, that's a normal CSS thing so touch.pagex so if I go back to the console and I pick pagex that's because I'm at 289 this top corner here is 289 so it doesn't matter where I click on here and move right uh, on, on side here you'll notice that it always goes down to that bit there so you could probably change that you know you could probably if you add add the height divide by two add the width divide by two you know that sort of thing you can probably get the middle um, of the div, I mean, uh, of the div, uh, and that would probably be slightly better. But this is just an example about how to do that. Okay. Right. So best practices: well, prevent zooming, as I say. You want to put that in to prevent zooming. Um, that's pretty straightforward, right? Anyway, default settings don't work very well for multi-touch since your swipes and gestures are often associated with browser behavior such as scrolling and zooming. To disable zooming, uh, set up your viewport so that it's not user scalable using the following meta tag. Some mobile devices have default behaviors for touch moves such as a, uh, the classic iOS over scroll effect uh, which causes the view to bounce back when the scrolling exceeds bounds of the content. This is confusing in many multi-touch applications and can easily be disabled. If you are writing a multi-touch application that involves complex multi-finger gestures, be careful how you react to touch events uh, since you will be handling so many at once. Consider the sample in the previous section that draws all touches on the screen. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've actually not really done that, um, uh, done that yet, but I'm going to do it in a minute. So that's, that's just about one touch on the screen, but we're going to get to that. trying to think. You know what, let's, let's look at this. Let's look at this example. Um, it's difficult to explain here because you can't really do multi-touch. It's very difficult to do multi-touch uh, in general. Um, so I think I might have jumped something here. Okay, so let's have a look at this example. Now what I did was I just decided because in the future we're going to be looking at something called kinetic.js that um, I would sort of jump ahead and make something pretty cool. Well not pretty cool but exactly the same as what they've made. Um, but uh, I've got lots of these open. So I have this thing called kinetic touch. Now kinetic touch if I open this, um, when I click on the screen, uh, hold on. When I click on, you know, you can see here that I've set this. When you click on this, it actually sets up so that if you have multiple touches on there, um, then you have lots of these dots on the screen. Now, if I show you the code for this, which I'm relatively proud of because um, <laughs> it's actually, I think, I think it's slightly better than the other example. Uh, I'll, I'll show you what I basically have done. 
Okay, so the first thing I've done is I've decided to take the CDN as something called kinetic.js. Now, I don't expect you to, to know that just now, and I don't want you to know that. I don't want you to jump into this at all. I just want to explain the, the processes about touch events in general. So I've created something called var touch one and var touch two. Um, and I've created var, uh, you know, I mean, I, I seem to have more at the bottom there, so obviously I've missed those out and it makes no difference whatsoever. But um, I also have var circle equals new array. Now the reason for this is I make uh, several different circles. Now I believe like 11 touch events is what you can get up to, or, or 12, uh, bizarrely, 11 touch events if that's even possible at once. Um, uh, so anyway, I create a stage, and a stage is something like a canvas, uh, it's an easy way to be able to do this, and you create it 400 by 400, which I have already, uh, then you add, uh, you create a new layer, which is, we're going to add layers to the stage, and then you can create objects in which you can add to different layers, uh, and this is good for games, uh, this isn't really meant for games, which is why I've chosen it directly, it's good for games, but it's not really meant for games, but it allows us to work out how to do things without just being able to take someone else's um, someone else's code, without really logically thinking about what we're doing. So I've created these circles which have a radius of 50, and I've set the x and y values equal to null, so they don't appear on the screen at all. And then I add them to the layer sequentially in this loop. Uh, so I made a, an array up here, I made an array. Uh, and now I um, decided to make these little circle objects, which I'll get access to in a little while. Now, stage.content.add event listener, uh, touch move, so I add that with an event. Where I have different touch touches, so touch1 equals event.touches0, uh, touch2 equals event.touches1, so that it handles up to four different touch events. And it works pretty well if you want to check it out um, on the, the iPhone, it works pretty well on that indeed. Um, so now then I set up some conditions in fact, so if uh, touch 1 and not touch 2 and not touch 3 and not touch 4 um, yeah then circle 0 dot um, set x and circle 0 dot set y is the equivalent to touch 1 dot client x and touch 1 dot client y uh, then circle zero dot show. Um, obviously, I'm showing in hiding, so you can see that I'm I'm evidently <coughs> using these um, things which uh, are inherent to kinetic dot js. Okay. Then similarly, I have touch one and touch two. If they exist, then touch three and touch four don't. Then show circle zero, circle one, because that's obviously the first one and the second one. And um, we've got a show for those two. If you've got three, then you want to show all three. If you've got four, then you want to show all four, and so on. And I'm sure, obviously, there's an easier way to do that. But this is just a basic example to show you what's happened. Um, and then after that, what we do is we draw the stage, and it works pretty fast and pretty good. Now, uh, stage dot get content dot add event listener touch end uh, basically tell it says if you take any one of your fingers off um, if you, you, then you just hide that or if you take them all off you just hide that but this, the, these conditions usually deal with this and touch end is just basically when you take your fingers off anyway and then what we do is we add the layer to the stage now in this relatively short amount of code um, we're able to do uh, something pretty powerful so I can only show you on here because we can't do multi touch events although you can Technically, um, using some sort of JavaScript thing, I would suggest you using your phone. If you don't have a phone like this, then use your friend's one, um, or get a hold of a. You've got tablets in the colleges, I believe. You can get a hold of them from the learning centre. So when you're in, get a hold of them and just go to your URL, put it into Dropbox, give it a try. It does make it harder to do. So I would actually just use basically. If I know that I can get one thing working okay, I would use that initially. All right. Um, it's a good place to start. Right, okay. I mean, it's notoriously difficult to debug these things. I'm being honest, it really is notoriously difficult to be able to do these things. You can't even do it on the emulators. The emulators are okay, but you can't do it on them either. So, um, yeah. So let's just see where I am. Okay. So as I said before, um, we're up to the multi-touch applications. Okay. 
So let me just add the point about set interval um, from the example, the first example. Set interval doesn't work very well, which is why we don't use it very often. So if I go to touch test, uh, I don't know if set interval is there. Um, it should have been there, I think. I don't know if you know what set interval is, <coughs> but you can use a set interval to, to get a hold of of everything at some sort of time and it's not a really good thing to do so it's not great for animations since it doesn't take into account the browser's own rendering loop um, but most modern browsers provide request animation frame and plus using kinetic.js means that we, we get full access to that I mean I don't really want you to go into kinetic.js just now I'm really just starting to to, to get um, with uh, to get the idea across so um, you can prevent scrolling by doing this, as I've said. You can render carefully. Um, so canvas dot add event listener render touches event dot touches. Um, so the the rendering of those is yeah. I'm just trying, sorry. Yeah. Target touches, change touches. Remember that event dot touches is an array of all fingers. We already know that. So event dot touches an array of all fingers, and we've seen that already in action. Um, it's difficult for mobile testing in, in general. Okay, so device support. Um, this varies quite a bit. Almost all recent Android and iOS based uh, devices will also support the touch start, touch end, touch move uh, events within each touch list. Uh, the touches, t target touches, and change touches list uh, touches touch lists. However, no tested browsers up to iOS 4.2 and Android 3.0.1 support radius X, radius Y, or rotation angle. And specify the shape of the finger touching the screen. During a touch move, uh, events fire roughly 60 times. Oops, 60 times uh, a second across all tested devices. Okay, so developing. Developing for mobile using JavaScript is often painful. Um, it's often easier to start prototyping on the desktop and then tackle the mobile specific parts on the devices you intend to support. Multi-touch multi -touch is one of those features that's difficult to test on PC since most PCs don't have touch input and having to test on mobile can lengthen your development cycle since every changes, change you make needs to be pushed to a server and then loaded onto the device. In all honesty, if you've got a mobile phone, we don't want to go into magic touch and stuff like that. If you've got a mobile phone, then um, use it. Go into the Dropbox folder, get Dropbox app, it's free. Uh, create a, a Dropbox account, get it all synced up, stick it in the public folder, send yourself an email with a link, and then bam, on your screen. Or you don't even need to do that, because we're not going to be using external files. Uh, mainly, we're not going to be using external files. We will do it at some point. Um, I would just you know, stick that on there, um, then you can go into your Dropbox folder and double-click on it, and it'll appear on the screen. So, um, yeah, or not double-click on it, but, you know, touch it. <laughs> as it were and that should work out pretty much perfectly okay anyway you can simulate them using magic touch I might go into that uh, during tutorial I was going to do that during tutorial but um, we'll see how that goes okay <laughs>